Welcome back to the Hillsdale College Constitution Town Hall. We're now having journeyed through the Constitution from the founders to the Civil War at present day. Some have referred to our present day condition as living in an administrative state, but nonetheless, citizens continue to have very important duties. What are those duties? We're very pleased that Hillsdale's president, Dr. Larry Arn, will be speaking in our final concluding session today. Dr. Arn is the author of Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education. You can find more information about this book on the Hillsdale website. To introduce Dr. Arn, Hillsdale College student Corinne Rombach, a junior at Hillsdale. She's interning this semester at FreedomWorks, where she's the Holiday Army FreedomWorks Scholar. Corinne. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Um, it is my honor to make this introduction. Larry P. Arn is the 12th president of Hillsdale College. He received his BA from Arkansas State University, graduating with the highest distinction. He received an MA in government and a PhD in government from the Claremont Graduate School. He also studied in England from 1977 to 1980, first as a research student in international history at the London School of Economics, and then in modern history at Worcester College, Oxford University. While in England, he also served as the director of research for Martin Gilbert, now Sir Martin, of Merton College, Oxford, and the official biographer of Winston Churchill. He returned to the United States in 1980 to become an editor for Public Research Syndicated, and from 1985 to 2000, he served as president of the Claremont Institute, an education and research institution based in Southern California. While at Claremont, he was the founding chairman of the California Civil Rights Initiative, which was passed by California voters in 1996 and prohibited racial preferences in state hiring, contracting, and admissions. Dr. Arn is on the board of directors of the Heritage Foundation, the Army War College, the Henry Salvatore Center of Claremont McKenna College, and the Claremont Institute. Published widely in national newspapers, magazines, and periodicals on issues of public policy, history, and political theory, he is the author of Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education, published by Hillsdale College Press in 2004. This afternoon, he will speak on the topic, the administrative state and the duties of citizens. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arn. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you all very much. Uh, Corinne says she was nervous coming up here because it's got to be false, but she says, I have a reputation for making fun of the students at Hillsdale College, and I would never do that. <laughs> but I do have to confess to you that uh, you may think that this parade of students who've come up here are chosen because they're uh, better looking and smarter than the average, because they do seem, you know, pretty good looking and smart. But no, these are the dumbest and the ugliest ones. We <laughs> Haha. <laughs> Her parents are probably watching. <laughs> Corinne is, uh, I've known Corinne since she was a freshman. She's a marvel. And thank you very much. And thank uh, David and the faculty members and the people at Worldwide TV here who've organized this for us. Um, I, I watched the faculty members this morning. They did such a fine job. I was reminded uh, maybe I'm not needed here. As you heard from Corinne, I've spent a lot of time studying Winston Churchill. And sometimes he would decline to go to a thing or give a speech because he said, um, Somebody really good was going, and he said, if you keep a dog, you don't necessarily have to bark yourself. <laughs> Thank you, RJ and Paul and David and all of them. Matt Spaulding, an old friend of mine, too. Well, I, mostly I want to thank you people in the audience here and the people on the Internet, because uh, this is a time of very great danger in our country. And it's almost an arithmetic or logical fact that it goes along with danger that there's opportunity there, too. And we have some marvelous opportunities in front of us, and that has so much to do with the attitude and the activity of the American people in these days. They are troubled, and they are doing things, and they are active, and they are thinking. And it's with the thinking that I hope to help, we hope to help today, it is our purpose at Hillsdale College, founded in 1844, to help with thinking. I'll tell you a little bit about the college in a minute, but mostly what I want to do today is just three things. I want to uh, summarize what's been said so far quickly. Uh, I want to uh, make a few recommendations about what we do, 
And I want to give one example, and then we'll be done. And I look forward to answering your questions. I'll go fast. The summary is uh, really in three points. One is, why are we in trouble today, as I said? What's wrong today? What's going on? And uh, I will argue in a couple of ways today that the important thing to understand about the Constitution is not this and that particular part of it, although each part of it is terribly important. It's not a very long document, and it's clear, and it means what it says. Uh, but the structure, the grand meaning of the document has been lost, and that's where we're in trouble. And I'm, I'm going to state that grand structure in a very simple way. In the Federalist Papers, James Madison says that this is the first purely representative form of government ever founded. What does that mean, purely representative? Why is that important? Why is that significant? Madison lived in a world in which there had never been such a thing as this, because the location of sovereignty Sovereignty means the legitimate title to rule is in an odd place in our country. In England, which, of course, was very much on their minds, the king was sovereign, and he was the executive branch of government. And so the sovereign got up every morning and ran the government. That changed, by the way, over time. Now the king is formally sovereign, but the real sovereign in England is the people acting under a constitution of which the king is the symbol. But that happened after our arrangements were completed here in the United States. In Athens, the people were sovereign, and when there was a law to be passed, they met to pass it. In the United States of America, the constitutional majority, says Lincoln, shifting easily with time and circumstance, is the only true sovereign of a free people. And in our country, we do not occupy any part of the government, and that means our only way to influence it is through elections. That's why elections are so important in our country. And when I say that there's a danger that the location of sovereignty might be adjusted, what I mean is the government itself has become a force large enough to be influential in elections, both by direct regulation of elections. Campaigns are now uh, very closely regulated, although I'm happy to report less closely regulated than they were a week ago before the Supreme Court uh, made its decision. And, and it's notorious that these regulations are contrived in a contest to pick who wins and loses. Uh, one of the reasons for the, for the support for the McCain-Feingold set on the floor of Congress by several different people was that there's this too much unfair criticism of people in office around election time. And you know, dang it, I can, <laughs> s I can see why that would just be terribly annoying. <laughs> and uh, they were going to, you know, sort that out a little bit. Um, but if, if sovereignty is outside, but then elections you know, think so many, what are we all afraid of today, by the way? It's in the paper, it's in every Tea Party report, it's in everything you see. People are afraid that they might be about to lose control. And the specific way they would lose control, if they did, is that elections would not be able to make any change anymore. Isn't the most common complaint you hear going around the country? And, you know, I have the blessing and the curse of going around the country a lot in my life. And, uh, you should watch that movie, Up in the Air. It's uh, an excellent account of what it's like to travel on airplanes all the time and the skills that one acquires to try to do it. That guy was a bit better at it than I am, but you're not completely better. And what do you learn when you go around? People think, is it really true now that what a lot of us think doesn't matter anymore? Because there's an established force, and it cannot be influenced anymore. And you heard R.J. Pastrito make the argument that it was part of the purpose, after all, to make the administrative establishment permanent in ways that would not be subject to alteration through politics. And if it becomes true, then, that the ultimate title to rule in the country passes from the people into the government, that would actually be worse than living in a monarchy or a direct democracy because we don't really have any constitutional structure 
to protect us from such a thing like that. We're not designed that way. It would be a kind of a collapse that would be very dangerous and very hard to recover from. So that's why there's a crisis, in my opinion. And the second reason there's a crisis is why is that happening? And I think the force behind this movement is worse than the movement itself if it can be. Because you've heard this description of this thing called progressivism. And, and by the way, it isn't controversial. The founders of that movement were explicitly in rebellion against the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And explicitly and over and over again in rebellion against the basic structure of the Constitution. They say that, right? And analyze that argument for a minute, and I'll just make two points about it. The first is, there are two ways to approach the question of power. In one way, the question is, the first question to answer is, what should I do? Look at the Declaration of Independence. It is, you know, a very beautiful thing. And it's the most beautiful thing of its kind ever. It is, for Americans, a sacred thing. It does contain mentions of God four times with enormous reverence. And what's so beautiful about the document is it is an assertive document. They write to the most powerful man on the face of the earth, and they say to that man, we are not going to obey you any further. In fact, you are misguided about something. We are your equals. But they all, and, they, and at the end, they, they, they pledge. And remember, it's so important that they pledge to each other. There's soldiers in this room and airmen and sailors and, and on the Internet, too. And what, 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 what do you learn about battle? A lot of people know it in these days because we've been in so many wars lately. Soldiers come to fight for each other, and the founders mutually pledge to each other their fortunes, their lives, and their sacred honor. But they don't begin that way. They actually begin the document in the opposite sense. It is so radically impersonal that it is specifically universal. When in the course of human events, that means any time, not our time, any time, it becomes necessary for one people, that means any people, not just us here, not just us here talking about ourselves, right, to dissolve the political bands and to, that have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Is that not beautiful? You see, and that means I am announcing to you, George, on pain of my life, that before I take any step, there is a standard before which I must bow, and by the way, so must you. And that means that whatever power comes to me and my friends after this, from you to us, we will be responsible to use it in accordance with this. And it is the specific idea of progressivism that we have to forget about that because there is no abiding standard. There is only the standard that we create as we go. And so first power, second the deliberation what to do about it. And I just submit that that is dangerous. I'm going to read it later maybe, but I'll read it now because it fits so well with where I just got to a plain proof that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Someone authoritative in American politics today writes, implicit in the Constitution structure, in the very idea of ordered liberty, was a rejection of absolute truth. The infallibility of any idea or ideology or theology, any tyrannical consistem, consistency that might lock future generations into a single unalterable course. Does that sound like the Declaration of Independence, or does it sound like its precise opposite? And that is a quote from a memoir entitled The Audacity of Hope, written by the President of the United States. And so you see, first, power, 
Second, figure out what to do. That's the problem. And without asserting, because by the way, I even don't believe it, that the people who are asserting this claim to power and to a departure from the most successful and most beautiful political principles and institutions that have ever been formed, that the people who propose that mean good and think that they can achieve endless good, right? But RJ points out there's a contradiction there, and that contradiction is also dangerous because how do you define good? That beautiful and wonderful term, which, you know, in the first sentence of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, which, by the way, is the first and also the last book ever written about the subject of ethics. Nothing better than that has ever been done. And he says, every voluntary human action of every kind seems to aim at the good. And, of course, the rest of the book is this investigation to discover the meaning of that term, not to create a meaning for that term. And I'm saying then that this systematic attempt to depart from the meaning of our nation and the reason behind it are both the danger we face. I want to give one example of what changes. And I'll give an example that I happen to know so much about because I am employed in a college. I know Kieran, right? I'm a teacher every term. I know Christina and her new husband played on our football team. They're sitting down there. And uh, so I have the job of managing this college and it's a wonderful job. It's, you know, it's like herding cats, except the cats are really smart, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you take so much joy from it. I, and, you know, the cats, by the way, it's not just the students. Then there's these grown-up cats who teach them, and you saw some of them on it. You know, you got to herd them, too. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to do, right? And, and, you know, it's strange about our college that its idea of itself is to work the way it worked in 1844. And here's what you learn about college. Did you know, by the way, that the word college means partnership? It's like colleague, right? It's something to do together. And, uh, and uh, so far is it possible to give a student an entitlement to an education that what you learn if you teach them is any successful teaching that has ever done is done because they're working at every moment that they're learning or else they are not learning. And I will tell you quickly how I learned this. I, I do know a fair amount about Winston Churchill and adore him and think, I wish you could have him today. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he was really good. He just was such a wonderful human being. And I love him very much. And I know stories that make me cry and others cry when I tell them. And uh, one day I told one of those stories and I noticed somebody yawned while I was telling it. And this was not long after I went to Hillsdale College and became a teacher. And I went home, and I was sad. And my wife said, what's wrong with you? I was kind of demoralized, which is not like me. And I said, you know, I take the most beautiful things I've ever learned, and I bore them with them. <laughs> How terrible. Wow. And, uh, and I had to learn better, right? And so I learned, don't tell them, ask them. And then they answer, and then... You know, like in my freshman class, I'm teaching the Constitution for the first time this term. We have this mandatory class everybody has to take on the Constitution. That means you read all these documents that everybody's been talking about. You have to read 400 pages that are available, I think, to you on the TV and here with us. And uh, I walked in the first day, and I said, okay, we started out with some readings from Aristotle, and the readings are about the subject of politics, what that subject means, and also why in nature are you a person born to be political in the same way that a horse is born to be a herd animal or a bee a hive animal or a dog to wag its tail. Why is that? And, you know, I was kind of cocky when I said it. And this, you know, girl, you know, she's not quite as tall as this podium, you know, and she's every bit of 18 years old. She held up her hand. Darned if she didn't tell me. It was shocking. <laughs> I went, wow, really? You know, she's a freshman. It was just too good. And so I gathered myself. Her name is Sarah. She might be watching. And I gathered myself. It took a minute, you know. I was put off, and I said, oh, I know what. So I remembered what to do, so I disagreed with what she said. 
And it took me a good 10 minutes to make her uncertain, right? But I, I needed to do that, right? Because it's not enough that I know that. She has to know that. And also, this is an academic institution. It requires to be argued and proved so far as can be. And that means, by the way, that a college is a place where a bunch of people get together and cooperate toward a common goal. And I can tell you something else. You cannot run it by rules. You have to run it by goals. Because the young so resent the rules. And in the beginning of the country, by the way, there was this massive subsidy of colleges given, first through the Northwest Ordinance and then later through the Land-Grant Colleges Act. And this subsidy was to reserve a portion of the Western lands, which is about as great an asset as any government ever owned, to, ed to benefit education in each township. So the federal government gave that subsidy, and then its involvement ended. And as it gave it, it announced the grand purpose of education, which I will repeat to you from the third of the organic, four organic laws of the United States of America, Article 3 of the Northwest Ordinance, which says religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind. Schools and the means of education shall ever be encouraged. And I can tell you something. There's no college in America more than 100 years old that is not founded with something like that in its founding statement. And there is almost no college that is run today according to principles that agree with religion, morality, and knowledge. But that beautiful statement was the end of the federal involvement. And then people in their localities, mostly in their townships, but secondarily in their states, had to take over doing this thing, which depends absolutely decisively upon the people in the room at the time that it is being done. And today, there are these subsidies of education that are not as large as those first ones, and they are accompanied by several hundred pages of rules that cannot be read. And I will tell you how I know that. I did try to read them. But uh, first I did once call our lawyer when I first got to Hilton, and I said, I want you to send me Title IV of the Higher Education Act, and he's a D.C. lobbyist in education whose job is to keep them from giving us any money. <laughs> cost, it costs quite a bit to do that. And, uh, and he said, no, I said, there's no use in my sending it to you. And I said, why? And he said, well, you won't be able to read it. And I said, really? You know, and he's, and you know, I, I was cocky, you know. I, I said, you know, I'm a f pretty smart guy. I can read, you know, and I've read a lot of complicated books, and I love them. And what are you, a lawyer? <laughs> and his point was, no, I can't read it either, right? We keep a specialist here to read it. By the way, how could you form a partnership around a thing like that? It is out of bounds on its face. It is ridiculous, right? But that is the point. The administrative state is top-down and seeks to uniformize everything and to subject everything to the will of a person scientifically trained at the top and remote from the activity. Winston Churchill, in this wonderful essay, which I put on the readings because it's so great, called Mass Effects on Modern Life, writes the darkest sentence he ever wrote, maybe, which is a description of the Bolshevik state, which he says is, by the way, only taking to extreme the tendency of modern government. And he says it reduces everything to the condition, not of the beehive because it cannot produce any honey. It produces it to the condition, it reduces it to the condition of the white ant. And then he turns. So you see, treat us like matter. Because, by the way, if we are evolving things produced by time and circumstance, aren't we material creatures then? Not with a immaterial and divine soul. You see, it is like we're matter, governed by instinct and the way the animals are. But then in the next most hopeful sentence, it is the glory and the safeguard of mankind that they are forever easy to lead 
and hard to drive. What's going on in America right now? Easy to lead and hard to drive. I have a few recommendations. How am I doing? I'll go fast. I recommend that we don't argue from the Constitution, but for it, toward it. We are in service to it. It's like a dynamite weapon, right? I very much believe that everything we should be, do should be done in the name of the Constitution, but in arguing, arguing with ordinary people, start with the stuff they know. And what do they know? They got their families, they got their lives, they're responsible for them, they got to take care of them. Remind them that they have a right to do that alongside their obligation. And tell them that the thing that they notice, and that is that the government is becoming big and expensive and intrusive and unaccountable and inefficient, which is its reputation, by the way, almost a consensus in the country, right? And that, uh, the proof of that is look at politicians from both parties and both you know, the conservative liberal spectrum, they all complain about bureaucracy. It's, by the way, one of the reasons why we can't have a perfect repeat of the Great Depression and the New Deal. Because when those things happen, by the way, people didn't have any experience with big government. Now they do. They don't like it. Start with that. Because, by the way, if you want to get rid of that, that's going to be really hard. Maybe impossible, but perish the thought that it is. But there is this blessing, and that is if you don't like that thing that you see, remember that there's this little manual that we have. And it is the greatest document ever produced to provide for centralized government, for centralized purposes, and decentralized administration for nearly every purpose. What if we worked our, ourselves back to that? And that brings me to my second point. We should look for politicians who say that is what they are doing and can speak intelligently about the point. And we have to make ourselves a judge of speak intelligently, which brings me to the next point, which is we need to be students. Time for us to read and think. And by the way, there's so much of that going on. There's a you know, big number of people watching this deal. And there's a bunch of us boring old guys talking all day long, and people are listening good thank you and it's not us you know it's the stuff we're talking about because it's beautiful and great and we have to learn to love that and we have to discipline ourselves by that by the way because James Madison you know when he wrote the Constitution he had already had the experience of Princeton of training himself how long he needed to sleep and what he do is take an hour a week away until he fell over and then he added an hour back, so then, then he could, you know, operate at peak assist, uh, consist, uh, uh, sorry, effectiveness and uh, for long times. And he read dozens of books, and he was smarter than we are, at least me. And, uh, and so we have a humility about it. We should study. We should give ourselves to the job of learning about it. And so many do now. Thank God for that. And we should look for politicians who show that same humility. Politicians, by the way, should not use the I word all the time. <laughs> you know you know who didn't do that, to name three? George Washington didn't do that. Go read his speeches. Abraham Lincoln didn't do that. Winston Churchill, you know, people think he was cocky because he was kind of. Turns out, in the end, he was a humble man. Read his speeches. And I'm just saying, those guys were pretty good, you know. And they didn't go around bragging about themselves all the time. And, I, you know, I'm not referring to anybody in particular when I say that. <laughs> Simple laws. I made a challenge once to some friends of mine in Washington. I held up the Higher Education Act of 2007 reauthorization, which is one of those thousand-page deals that you can't read and nobody did. And uh, I held up another complicated law, one of the most beautiful laws ever written, a, a law that deployed enormous amounts of land in the western states into private hands. It's called the Homestead Act. It was, it was signed by Abraham Lincoln in 1862. And I said, you know, I know you guys can write stuff like this. It's a miracle you can do it. It's like a dog walking on the hind legs. It doesn't look very good, but wow, you can do it at all. It's amazing. <laughs> but could you write this four-page thing? 
I said, I, I made a dare to them because they're good people. You know, I said, look, if you could do it in a week, I know you can do this in a week. If you can do this in a week, I'll give you a thousand bucks of my money. I, I didn't have to pay. <laughs> Madison in 62nd Federalist. It will be of little avail to the people that the laws are made by men of their own choice. If the laws be so voluminous that they cannot be read or so incoherent that they cannot be understood, if they be repealed or revised before they are promulgated or undergo such incessant changes that no man who knows what the law is today knows what it will be tomorrow. Right? James, and you know, James Madison, you think he's not better than these guys who are running things today? He was good. You know, I mean, cosmically good, wonderfully good. What a guy. The father of the Constitution. And his advice is keep it simple. We should demand that. Because remember, there's a relationship. If sovereignty is in the constitutional majority, then the bosses are outside the government, and they should do their work in a way that is comprehensible. Commitment should be extracted for that. And this talk of the complex society and how infinitely, blah, blah, everything changes so fast, I can tell you, nobody who knows how to run a company today doesn't know that the rule is push authority down as far as you can. All the successful companies say that. And B, and B, run things by goals and not by detailed rules. And by the way, you know an institution that is run that way today? The Marine Corps. And the rest of the services too. And you know they're good at what they do. I'm on the board, as Karen mentioned, I'm on the board of the Army War College. And I had dinner with a bunch of colonels, you know, one night. I've done it several times. And and after the dinner, we just talked, you know, and it was so much fun, and they're so inspiring and such great people. And by the way, like Madison, they all know how long they need to sleep, <laughs> down to the minute. They test all the time, get the most out of themselves. And I said, uh, as I was leaving, we were leaving, I stood up and I said, I have a toast to make to, to you people. And they said, what's that? And I said, I have learned something tonight. And they said, what? And I said, do not make the mistake of getting into a war with you guys. <laughs> that won't go well. You see? So the point is this complex, you know, oh gosh, it's all so confusing and everything's so tangled and we got to run so much. Make it simple. Then everybody can cooperate to get it done. That's how a college works. That's what a college means. Finally, we should have a plan. We need policies that will lead us back by simple and understandable steps and meanwhile won't scare the, the horses and disrupt the society toward constitutional rule and limited government. And that's going to take a lot of thinking. Uh, once Churchill, in a great moment, he was upset about the trench warfare in World War I, and uh, they were sitting around in the cabinet talking about how glorious the young men were and how they... You know, we gave him a speech about the cause of victory. And Churchill put his fist down on the table, and he offended everybody. Of course, he had this gift for doing that. And he said, uh, those brave young men that you send out every day, perishing 10,000 a day, they actually have a cause already. They don't need you for that. They need a plan. So we need to be working on a plan, and the plan should be simple. I have an item to suggest to go in the plan. We have a debt problem. And it's in the arithmetic of the world that there's two ways to pay debt. And one way, one way is to pay it out of income. That means taxes. And the other way is to make what we call in accounting, I used to study accounting in undergraduate school, a balance sheet transaction. You could trade assets for debt. Guess how the Revolutionary War debt was paid? sold land. In fact, the urgent wish was to get the land into private hands as rapidly as possible because that was understood to be in the public interest. After they paid the debt by selling the land, then in the Homestead Act, they started giving it away. 
And remember about the giving it away provision, that the land where it was given away, that couldn't have just been a political deal because most of it was not yet states. And so that meant that the congressman who put through the Homestead Act didn't do it to get reelected. It seemed like the right thing that people should own some land, sell the dang land. And by the way, we own more land than we used to. Because if you look at a map shaded in the United States of public versus private land, if you look in the east, it's all private. And as you go farther west, it becomes more and more public until you get to Alaska and Nevada, where there's hardly any private land. Why? Because it was settled in a time when the principles had changed, and it was thought that the public interest was served by public ownership. I think we should take that on. And I think rather than uh, paying all those taxes, we should sell a lot of assets. Cities, you know, they're broke now, are uh, selling assets like roads and toll roads and stuff like that to get money. We should sell assets for debt. But we should think of other things like that, which don't have to be fundamentally disruptive, that can be simply understood. And by the way, that idea needs a lot of work. And I'm a school teacher. What if we look for politicians who are thinking about stuff like that? and who are creative at thinking up ideas to get us back toward the goal. Because that, too, is a decentralized tax, uh, a, a task where a lot of people have to get together to pursue the task. So as I say, then, if you could get the ends right, and the ends are controversial, and the controversy is simple to state, is it true, as it says in the Declaration of Independence, that there is such a thing as a nature of man? Is it true that under that nature, no man may be governed by another man as any man may be governed by a horse? If that was true then, it is true now. If it is not true now, it was not true then. And that means, by the way, that the progressives cannot uh, claim, as they say reasonably, that their principles are a development on the revolutionary principles. They are a rejection of them, and they must be because they are logically and mutually exclusive. That's the first part of the controversy. And the second is, shall we have the government structures that fit those first principles or these new principles? And if we adopt the first, then we must work our way back toward constitutional rule. And once we agree about the ends, then the means will begin to come into shape. And that is the substance of our task after we can agree about the ends. So it seems to me then that this revival requires some thinking. And I will promise you all that at Hillsdale College, we will be doing that thinking because it is in our charter to do it from 1844. And we have not abandoned that. And we shall not accept by force. And it will take a lot of force. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Arn. We have time now for plenty of questions. Again, if you're viewing this at home, please feel free to email us at kirbycenter at hillsdale.edu. Our first question comes from Paul from Modesto, California. Could you please paint a picture of what America might look and feel like today if we had not followed the path of becoming an administrative state? Uh, everybody would be better looking. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, remember, by the way, that heaven doesn't happen here on Earth. And there will always be a lot of trouble. Uh, human vice is what it is, and people are imperfect. Uh, my wife is a help to me in that regard. <laughs> so uh, don't think that there'll be nirvana, but, uh, you know, I think we'd probably be a lot richer. I think that uh, if you look at the good things in the country today, the things that I think are the best things, uh, the American gift is uh, self-actuation, uh, charity. You know, by the way, we are the most philanthropic people on the face of the earth. There's really nobody. It's a difference in kind, really, from others the amount of giving and care for our communities. And so a lot of stuff would be handled at the local level. The country has become very wealthy. And uh, that's, you know, 
partly to do with technology, but not really. Because the greatest growth story in history of any country is not China today. It's the United States in the 19th century. And that was before the dawn of such rapid advances in technology, although there were some then. What really happened there was they managed to delegate uh, to people the management of their lives and the ownership of their property. And so I think the economy would do very well in such a thing, especially if the federal government did the things it's very much supposed to do for the economy, like uh, to name some forgotten ideas, sound money, secure contracts, a light burden of government, equal laws, strong national defense, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so I think you could get a richer country, but that's not the main thing. People thrive when it's delegated to them. That is to say, the natural thing they own, which is the right to live and attempt to live well, is mainly in their hands. And I think there'd be improvement if you had that. This question comes from Ted in Bismarck, North Dakota. We know what Churchill did in the Second World War, but what did Churchill think about progressives and progressivism? Uh, the, the, Churchill was, um, uh, he was a great man, and I, I think in his life, uh, he conceived his life to be a struggle against the same problem at home and abroad, these various forms of virulent um, historicist thought. So he was an anti-socialist, very powerful one, in the same way that he was a, a uh, anti-Nazi and an anti-communist. He said in 1945 that uh, um, uh, the Socialist Party, with which he had been in coalition during the war, uh, could not achieve its ultimate aims without the use of a secret police. And then he mentioned a Gestapo, very strong words, right? And he was at that time the sort of greatest man in the world. And that was controversial, and the socialists beat him in the election. I, don't, I think that's what he thought, and I think he thought it all his life. Churchill was in favor of uh, social welfare policy things that are some of them not unlike the things we're debating today. And, uh, and I think that takes some understanding. I know that he, uh, and he said very much that he feared the growth of bureaucracy. And uh, I think that we're in the realm of prudence there, especially as regards England, um, because England doesn't have our constitutional system, right? It's not, it's, first of all, it's not a written constitution. Churchill wrote a, a wonderful 1936 essay about that called What Good is a Constitution, in which he compares the British and the American, and he gives very high praise to both and says that the fixity of ours is an advantage, with some disadvantages too, but you should keep it. So I, I think, you know, first of all, Churchill lived a long time ago, and he's dead now, so to say what he would think about stuff right now is a doubtful task, but I can tell you what he thought about related stuff in his life, and I just did. And I think he'd be very worried today about bureaucracy because he was in his own time, and it's much larger now than it was then. And I think he would, he's very much an anti-socialist. And that's not really what, especially in America, what the progressives ever called themselves. They have a more fluid set of purposes with some of the same ideas in mind. And I think he would oppose that because he did in his lifetime. But I add the caveat that there are some things today that I am very much against that he was for. And I think about that a lot. This question comes from Mark, uh, West Palm Beach, Florida. I am foreign born and American by choice. What can or should we do to change the sad state of our public school system, which has failed in its responsibility to educate its students in American history, its constitution, and the American identity? Um, uh, my father is a public school teacher all his life, and I went to the public schools until I got to graduate school. And um, the Northwest Ordinance sort of sets them up. So fixing them seems to me like a really good thing. And I think there's a couple of things wrong with them. Uh, one of them is they've, in very considerable extent, got the wrong idea. Their idea now is, uh, you know, if you look at the AP Guide to Secondary Literature, uh, that's, a, you know, you know, what the advanced placement courses, look them up if you don't know what they are, but you probably do. 
It's a very influential thing in education. And what that guide says about literature is, is that uh, objectivity and factuality are out the door. Now we teach students to find their own reality in the text, no doubt hoping they will find values to guide them through a mad, mad world. That's a quote, you know, pretty close. And you can, the thing, you know, it's almost exactly what it says. And, and the point about that is that deprives the kid of the reason to read the book, you know, and little wonder they don't read it. Uh, but then also, uh, so another, that's, that's related to the phenomenon. They don't, the basics are what you should learn. By the way, in life, my own opinion is you don't really ever get very much beyond the basics. They become more beautiful to you as you go. And uh, eventually they become a wonderfully elevated thing. I'd focus on that. And then I would decentralize them. Because remember, you don't run much very well by top-down rules. And so the high school where my dad talked. Taught. I know, happen to know, I don't, maybe I don't sound like it, I don't know, but uh, I know a lot of grammar. And the reason is we had this fierce, mean old teacher named Mr. Amos in Pocahontas, Arkansas. His daughter is, uh, I still know his, both his daughters. He, he passed away not long ago, and he was just meaner than heck, right? He should be liberated to do that. And by the way, I don't know grammar because somebody passed a rule in Little Rock, Arkansas, or Washington, D.C. Mr. Amos, he was the mean guy. He's the important person. Organize it like that. Our next question will be from our studio audience. Sir. Gary Meredith, Fairfax, Virginia. Hi. Hi. Uh, I know this is being uh, broadcast and recorded and archived, uh, so I want to start with a disclaimer that I'm not advocating the overthrow of the federal government. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, but on the other hand, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we are now uh, subjected to government uh, which passes rules, regulations, laws, and intrusions in our lives for which they can cite no authority. At what point, at what point do the people say your rules, laws, regulations are, no, are not binding, that we are under no obligation to follow them? That's a good question. Now you're the, going to be recorded. That's a... Uh, that's, um, so, so first of all, not this point. Uh, you know, we, we have elections in this country. We should focus on them. And the law, we should try to have the rule of law and respect it ourselves. <coughs> I'll tell you an example, by the way, to help you answer your question, Gary, whom I happen to know. Um, in the, we, we're just going through this in my class right now. In the steps leading up to the Declaration of Independence, there was enormous doubt about what to do, and it seemed like a mighty big step to declare independence from the King of England. And people of very good conscience and individual people inside themselves didn't know what to do, right? And the Declaration of Independence says about that as a guide that when a long train of abuses evinces a design to reduce them to an absolute despotism, it says that. That's your standard. And it says before that, prudence indeed will dictate that governments will not be changed for light or transient causes. And our government is such a great thing that we should be very reluctant, very more reluctant than any was, one was to rebel against the king of England because this is a better government than the one that George III was running. But I will tell you that if you follow those steps along, you know, you read your – De Daniel Delaney and you read your James Otis and then you get to your, in our reader, then you get to a summary view of the rights of British North America. And then now, at last, Thomas Jefferson is writing and the first team is on the field. He could write. And, uh, and he lays it out for the king really good. And that's a step along the way, along with Tom Paine's common sense, toward the revolution. And I don't think we're going to get there, and I pray that we do not very earnestly. But I think if we did get there, we would want to be as reasonable and high-minded and self-restrained as the people who made our first rev revolution. And that's a long way down the road. And as I say, one prays not to go there. And if he got there, how could we ever do it so well as it was done the first time? The next question comes from an online participant, Raj from Trenton, New Jersey. How can we get back to an ethic or code of responsibility? 
We have a Bill of Rights, but what about a Bill of Duties? It seems strange to talk like that, but how can we start talking about duties and responsibilities in a way that others can understand? Uh, well, uh, the answer to that is um, contained in a quick Google search. Uh, go find uh, Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address. It's a model of the type. And remember in this regard that America is in one sense a very old country, the oldest country ever, because its constitutional history is so continuous compared to any previous example, especially any example of a written constitution. And so Reagan stands up in 1981 and he does what every president has done, which took the same oath and turn around and make a speech of roughly the same length. And his is a model. It begins by uh, the, uh, a point about self-government, two points really. The first thing he does, by the way, is demote himself. In the first paragraph it says roughly, uh, for some of us today, this is a momentous occasion. He's talking about himself and his family and his friends. But of course, in the life of the nation, it's a regular event. And that's one of the glories of the nation, he says. Isn't that great? Yeah. Uh, and then he says, um, this economy is in a god-awful mess, and uh, we're not going to fix it. You're going to fix it. Right? Then down farther, he turns, you know, because by the way, the first person to have it back on the west or back into the Capitol looking at the National Mall was Reagan, uh, Obama, is the second. And Reagan did it to take us on a tour of the monuments. And he spoke of this wonderful respect to the founders, you know, who in George Washington, who in his humility had the courage to found a nation of Lincoln. Whoever will understand the meaning of America will find it in the life of that man. And then in the final stage, he goes across the river. And he points at the crosses and stars of David before each one planted a hero like these men I've mentioned. In other words, every one of them, like George Washington and Abe Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson. And then he picks out his first hero, who happens to be a man named Martin Trepto. And he says of him, he was in the Rainbow Division and one of the first Americans killed in the Expeditionary Force. And he reads from this man's diary. And this man says, we must min win this war and I must do my part as if the whole result depends on me. Now, you want to know why this peaceful, democratic, commercial republic produces soldiers like nobody? Because in our country, we get the habits of competition and cooperation of a free people. And so our armies get on the field, and they just figure it out and do it. And also, they are possessed in their souls with the idea that it is their cause and they are responsible for it. And all of the great high moments in American political history contain, are blessed with somebody who can articulate that point. And it echoes in the breast of every American. Don from San Diego, California asks, you've mentioned several readings that we should look to to understand the Constitution better. Can you give us, uh, us ordinary Americans a short list of books that would help us in our attempt to grow in our appreciation and understanding of the Constitution? Well, you should, everybody should read that Constitution reader, which I, you know, I didn't think that up. I've been adding to it a little bit lately because pride makes me do it. But, uh, you know, there's a, collection of people around our college who, and there, you know, there has been for a long time, but lately there's a kind of revival of that who really have thought very deeply about that. And that reader is a product of an understanding of the movements of American history. And remember, a feature of it is we love the Constitution. We read the people who opposed it. We love the Union. We work at an abolitionist college, right, had a big part in the Civil War. We read the thinkers of the Old South. We don't like the progressive movement. We teach them by reading its key authors. So that's how you learn. If you learn fair and true and stand up ready to make the argument, 
I admitted something about Winston Churchill that probably nobody listening to this knew, but I had to tell you the truth about it, that he was in favor of a lot of this stuff we're talking about today for Britain. And I can read those circumstances to you, and I can put an argument together about why that was and why that doesn't apply here, but the facts got to be admitted all the same. So I'd start with that, and then I don't believe you got to read Aristotle if you want to know what politics are. you got to read the list of books that uh, Jefferson said you should read in a letter to Madison, if I remember where it came, the elemental books of public writing named, well, it wasn't to Madison, uh, Locke and Sidney, and I can't remember what they were, but Plato and Aristotle. So I, w I would work on that, and, you know, there are extracts from some of those things in this reader, and... Uh, you know, there's a curriculum at Hillsdale College, and you can uh, get a copy of that. Easy if you go to our website or write me a note or send me an email. This will be our final question, and I can assure you that no payment was tendered for the rendering of this question. <laughs> Karen from Lincoln, Nebraska asks, aside from sending my teenager to Hillsdale College, what else can I do to help educate this next generation of bright minds? Have more teenagers. <laughs> Learn yourself. Teach others. You know, by the way, remember, it, it, we think it's a miracle what's going on right now. This is the pattern. The revolution itself starts in the Great Awakening, right? It's a religious movement. It's a social movement. Finally, it becomes a political movement. Finally, there's a plan. The Civil War followed the same course. People talking and thinking in their concern and fear and honesty, the best of them, not claiming they know everything, but putting their arguments together, together carefully with citations and quotes and reading and reasoning carefully and trying to prove. What do you think the character of the committees of correspondence was like? And so, by the way, if you are such a person, and it's only a function of how you spend your time, then you will find that your fellow citizens will turn to you and look at you and say, wow, thank you for that. And then what you tell them is, and by the way, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I can say that personally. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Arn. Before we adjourn for the day, I just wanted to make a couple of brief announcements. That is that if you are watching this at home and missed one or more of the presentations, they will be by this evening available in an archival form. If you have uh, caught the entirety of it, but you'd like to tell your friends, family, or colleagues about the program, they can register starting this evening to watch the program at constitutiontownhall.com. Also, to those of you who have registered and to anybody else who's interested, just write us a, drop us an email and we'll send notice out to all of those of you who did register about the DVDs. The DVDs for this uh, uh, Constitution Town Hall will be available soon and we'll be sure to send you word about when they are available. In addition, we would uh, encourage you to visit the, the two websites that we've mentioned throughout the day, hillsdale.edu and also the kirbycenter.org. George Washington said the Constitution is that which he never will abandon. It's the guide that he will never abandon. We join him in today making that pledge and appreciate your participation in this Constitution Town Hall. Have a great day.